with Tiny Pulse. And I'm super excited to be sitting here in the offices of LimeAid, right next to their founder and CEO, Henry Albrecht. And um, uh, LimeAid is a company that's a corporate wellness technology company that drives real employee engagement. Uh, Henry started LimeAid in 2006, <clears throat> and he really took the idea right from his basement to now one of the highest growth industry-leading SaaS companies that was recently named the best place to work in Washington. Uh, Henry's completely committed to building a values-driven culture. He's done it from day one and really uh, fostering a culture of improvement on Limey, at Limey. So, Henry, thanks for being with hey, us Hey, Kevin, great to have you, and I think it's a really important topic, so it should be fun. Great. So let's just talk about first what do company values do. Um, and let's take Whole Foods, for example. I think a lot of people look at it as a company. They go to buy kale and other things like that. And for them... Um, it's more than just the transaction. They have a lot of values about being a part of the community, being sustainable, being the healthiest market out there. And that's really the difference between kind of a transactional based business and one that cares about values, which really are the qualities, the behaviors, the mores you want to drive your day to day business decisions as well as your long term strategy. They even include their investors in this. So I think more and more we're seeing really kind of mission based, uh, values driven companies. Yeah, and it's hard work too. I mean, we've worked with some awesome companies, and you have to be really intentional about culture. They're they're kind of the things around which you can shape your business. So uh, we also, you know, like Whole Foods and like a lot of other great employers, you have to really be aspirational with values. They have to be something that's not about the next quarter's numbers or the next year's results. It has to be something that can last for 20 or 30 years. So um, this webinar, I'm sure, will be played in the year 2050. Uh. <laughs> well. Um, and, you know, if you don't have values, don't worry. Um, we're going to share some really easy exercises on how to pick some values and how to make them memorable. Uh, and I'll start first with one of my favorite. It's called the Mission to Mars uh, exercise. And what you basically do is you say uh, you're going to go on this hypothetical mission to Mars and you only can bring five people. And then in thinking about who are the five people that you work with you would bring, you make a list and you make a list of you would be on your top five of somebody you'd want to bring along, and then you bring the list, make the list of people who you wouldn't want to come, and from that you start looking at each of those people. I bring Katie because she's super positive, and you've got to have that if you're going to be facing kind of these very these conditions that aren't really conducive to human life. So I'd want somebody very positive there. I'd want somebody resourceful there, like Andrea. So you start writing those things down, and from that you can really kind of. Um, really understand what values you think are important and really help um, identify those. Yeah, I think I think it, in addition to liking people, it also goes a little bit more uh, beyond like too. It's more like, will these things stand the test of time 20 to 30 years from now? And you might actually not always like them, but you have to respect them and know that they're also committed to the same set of values. Uh, I think of values as also they have to be connected to the strategy of the business. So it's great to have things that that connect with your end customers. I think that that's how you know everybody is fed by their customers. And so if you have values that are not just aspirational for your people, but they can connect for 20 or 30 years with the people you're selling to, it's really important to have that. It's great. You know, one of the things that we do at Tiny Pulse is we ask the question of uh, whether or not you know your company's values, and I'm always surprised by uh, the number of employees that don't, even even if they're written on walls or they're provided in new hire orientation. So it's really important once you uh, pick those valuables to really make them stick and make them memorable, and you can do this a couple different ways. At Tiny Pulse, what we do is we, uh, we turn our values into an acronym. So we have DELIGHT, the D stands for delighting customers, all the way down to the T for treasuring culture and freedom. Uh, the other thing you can do, is, especially if you have a lot of millennials, is just kind of make uh, a little a little bit more hip. So you can see at Sylvan Technologies, uh, they kind of use this text messaging based approach with this "be the best you can be," uh, and I think things like that really um, help make your values stand out. Or you can just Simple it, make it super simple, and uh, Galgun Insurance, they do one word values, candid, driven, passionate. Those are really easy things to re remember. So, 
Peter, I'd love to hear about how you came up with your values and what you do to make them memorable and what you do to make them stick. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, so because Limeade, this little wheel here at the right, um, kind of shows what our business is about. We're about building great companies uh, who invest in the well-being of their people. We have tons of great research that shows that when you have people with high well-being, they're super engaged at work and deliver better business results. So we really focus on that upper corner invest in well-being part as a business. Um, and for us, well-being means you have an emotional connection to your work. And engagement, engagement, I'm sorry, means you have an emotional connection to your work. So when you're really engaged, it means your work means something to you beyond the paycheck. Uh, one of our employees at one of our customers once said, I think about my company as more than just a paycheck, and they think about me as more than just a nurse. <laughs> so that, to me, is like truly epitomizes employee engagement, and that's what we want. And you can see how values tie into that, is if you're going to have something that means something to someone at a really visceral level, um, it's not just about money then. It's really about values, shared values, shared purpose, shared meaning. So we actually tried really hard, like those awesome companies you mentioned, Sylvan and whatever, to get a great acronym. You guys came up with Delight. We just couldn't do it. So we, we have six values. Um, we didn't get... Uh, we didn't quite get it. But these all also all tie to our business strategy. So we have, you know, for example, delighting our customers is we know exactly why that's there. We know that none of us would be here without our customers. We also know we're in the well-being business, and if we can't take care of ourselves and our own well-being and have great policies and benefits and structures to support people in their lives, then how can we, with credibility, talk to our customers about that? I mean, that's our business. So be it to us is about working on something. So we have this co concept of a culture of improvement. We don't have a culture of everybody's a size two. We don't have a culture of nobody ever has a drink after work. We have a culture of everybody has to be working on something at all times. And so those are actually really strategic for our business. We're trying to help our customers do the same thing. So I think when you think about values, Think about the employees and what's aspirational when people walk in the door, but also think about something that they can carry with full authenticity into a sales meeting, into a customer support call, into you know a partner meeting. So if you can kind of carry it through everything you do, mm -hmm. um, it's really valuable. And we also know, for example, that things aren't perfect and uh, you have to speak plainly. So uh, any you yeah, have a question? I have, or? Yeah, I have a question. So you started this company and at what point did you do your values? Was it after you got five customers? Was it after you raised your first big round of funding? Like, when did you do that? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of companies actually kind of start with the values. Maybe the reason that they left their prior place of work is they didn't have values alignment. And so I think I kind of fall into that camp is I had a pretty high-paying job when, when I left to do this. Not great, but, you know, pretty good. And I didn't leave because I couldn't you know, take care of my family. It was more I really wanted to feel aligned with my work. So this was actually probably as soon as we had a team. We went out and uh, had a happy hour after work. We grabbed the nearest piece of paper and a pen and asked the question, what do we want to stand for? And so even if you're not a startup, even if your company has been around 100 years, it's a good exercise to get people around the table and say, do we still believe in the things we stood for? So you can see all the different handwritings there. That, that, that's not all mine. I don't even know if any of those are mine. But words like evidence and community and do good and happiness and forthrightness and ethical business practices. So we actually had a list of values before we had a product. Um, as it turns out, we've actually codified those into six values. The first five years of the company, we actually had four values. And then after five years, you know, every company changes over time. We got together and we held full employee focus groups and said, are these still the right values? And we kind of reaffirmed the values we had democratically. But then we asked a second question, which is what's missing here? What are, what's important to our business or our culture that's not reflected in these? So we ended up adding both own it and we're a team to our values. Own it is about just being accountable to your peers for results and where a team is about teamwork, 
those are actually things that we've always valued but we never codified or wrote down because frankly when it's just five people working on a problem you don't really need to say out loud we're a team because it's so painfully obvious but maybe when you have you know as we do now about 200 people it's important to kind of vet for that and these are things that we as you'll hear about in a second use in various ways in our company to run our business so um, you know we do have them up on our wall you can see we've got a fairly well lit lime green 10 foot high wall with our values written on it actually this next picture over we use we took that at our company picnic we use this as the first slide of our sales deck I mean we want people to know that that we use this in our business and it's also part of our everyday work so if you think about the business that you're in maybe it's human resources or benefits management or just running a company and thinking about people there are several steps to that I think we have we've identified maybe 12 steps things like pre-hire awareness recruiting interviewing the offer process what goes into the policies and procedures that you do your benefit strategy your compensation your performance review even how you part ways with employees um, every single one of those we filter that process that HR function through our values and you can see here's one example employee ratings um, this is you know after the interview is oh, oh I'm sorry this is an interview our interview tool we use is after the interview is over rate people on the values so we think about this in interviewing our performance reviews um, include values how you do your job from a functional point of view and then how you do it from a value point of view our product in the well-being space is a you know a mobile and social product about improving well-being but we think values are part of that that's part of your meaning and purpose and we know that meaning and work and purpose and work are part of well-being so I actually recorded a little video that we offer in a challenge we give people points and now I know real time that 97 percent of people know for example the founding story of the company or they know uh, the values we will show some data on that in a second but to me having that first and foremost in your product and how you do hiring and how you do onboarding even in how you make promotion and compensation decisions we're looking for people who get a lot of stuff done who deliver results who own it but who do so also in a way that enhances the culture and, and makes it stronger and and frankly we're not always perfect and Lord knows we make all kinds of mistakes here but we want to be able to have a conversation about values in, in every in every workday and so here's a couple other examples um, of of that we actually have company awards a lot of companies have company awards on the right here is uh, Gary he won a glass lime for um, exemplifying our values we actually give away six of these awards twice a year to employees and we give away six because we have six values so I don't I think Gary might have won the we're a team value or whatever value he won it's really important that we tie how we recognize people to our values we also have something called own it day own it being one of our values that was a whole company-wide um, effort to create a more more scalable delivery of our, of our products and services we had you know we helped prioritize issues to fix and cross-functional projects and we just looked for a whole bunch of quick wins and all the none of the ideas came top-down all the ideas came bottom-up and one ex specific example of values helping our businesses um, there was a certain function in the delivery of our software where people were had to wake up at midnight to do some specific um, technical configuration work so imagine how stressful that is and how it affects negatively affects sleep and all kinds of other goodwill you can have in your company we you have 10 people in the company you have to get up at midnight and stay up till 2 a.m. a few times a year and it doesn't feel like a team effort it feels like wait why do I have to do this so that was a great example of something we said this is a problem we need to fix as a company because frankly we're letting our team members down by kind of messing with their well-being so fixing that is the kind of thing we fix that own it day and are the awards is that nominated by other, your peers and other employees or is it managers that decide this yeah we've we've actually run the full spectrum um, we always look for nominations 
for these types of things. We'll ask managers, we'll ask every employee, uh, and then you know there's always a little bit of discretion as well. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a full blend. You know it, that's one of the challenges in business is it's not always a pure democracy, but we always look for the best ideas to come from from everyone, kind of regardless of where they sit in the org. So one other example is how we use, you know, we're, we're doing the webinar, but we're also big fans of Tiny Pulse and the products they deliver. Uh, we use Tiny Pulse Perform, which is their uh, ongoing kind of discussion manager for when you have one-on-ones with your employees or, or with your manager. And so we actually ask people to rate their own work and have managers rate them every month on I consistently demonstrate the Limeade values. We link to the values and we ask people to provide examples. And I think there have been times when I give myself a low rating because maybe I was less optimistic and didn't think about anything as possible. Or sometimes I do well on three or four and, and I don't do well on one or two, but having that discussion is just a way to reinforce it. You can't expect things to get better in your culture if you're not willing to have a discussion about your culture. And so we like to think about values as you know, the structure around the discussion. Uh, we, in our weekly, we do weekly surveys as well through Tiny Pulse Engage. Um, and I've always, I always tell people I care so much more about the response rate than the score. If, if, if our score is trending down on the happiness of our employees, I can live with that as long as I know that almost everyone in the company is giving their feedback every week because you can only manage what you know about and understand and, and the free form comments help us to see you know what guys I think we made a cultural snafu with that move or I think the way we handled this circumstance could have been better and you know like I said you can see that, that the scores aren't always perfect but in general we have um, very high responses to comments like this one is overall Limeade employees live our values also known as culture of improvement this is actually one of the five key performance indicators of our whole business. We have one around growth. We have one around how happy our customers are. Um, things, you know, financial things like gross margin. But this score directly impacts the bonus, not just the me, but everyone on my team. So, so thinking about this as a way to manage your business is really a great way to so keep it going. So when you go to your board meetings, you actually report on this? That's correct. Every, every board meeting we report on this metric. And, uh, and we're looking for an increase over where we started the year on this metric as well. And it's hard work, like I said. Um, I think in some ways, you know, being 200 people is a lot easier than being 20,000 or 200,000 people to do this. So having tools and resources to get to the manager level is really critical and really hard. So whether it's a well-being program, an engagement program, a, a survey tool or whatever, getting not just um, the leadership team on board, but everyone on board at every level, that's the big challenge I think in HR software and making tools that connect with managers and the people they work with every day is really important. Um, so, you know, here's, we also use Cheer for, Cheers for Peers. Um, we just kind of color coded. I'm not going to read these, but in, in thinking about this, we just did a little search and color coded uh, the values as they show up. So we picked a couple quotes here where people actually were picking, using two of our verbatim values in the same feedback session. And it's not always good. Looks like we had some, you know, customer funding issue that was solved or, uh, on the next one, it talks about um, speaking plainly in an employee focus group. Maybe, maybe we were actually working through some bad stuff at the company. So for us, it's not about being perfect. It's about um, having transparency around what you aspire to be. Um, we, like I said at the start, we set values goals that are 20 or 30 years in the future. We're not expecting a 10 out of 10 score now, but we expect, we believe that the, the companies who aspire not just to win the game. I'm a sports guy, so if you'll forgive me a sports analogy. Yes, we're trying to win the game. Yes, we're trying to win the championship that year. But this values are more like, do you want to have a Hall of Fame career as a company? Do you want to be known as someone who had organizational and cultural excellence for decades, not for years and quarters? And 
we get asked a lot, wow, you really invest a lot in that. Is it worth it? And so I want to share a few numbers about why we think it's worth it, but we would do it anyway. I think probably if you're on this webinar, you're the kind of company that already thinks this way. Um, but we also know it's important when we're allocating resources every year to think about how we're allocating them. I mean, we have a board of directors. We have people who are saying, are you being financially responsible and are you getting the bang for buck for your investment? So here's some of how we measure that. Um, this year, we're averaging 113 applicants per job opening. Um, if you average our percentage uh, annual unwanted turnover, it's under 5%. It's very easy to put an ROI number on that, especially in a skilled workforce where it's, where attracting, which is the first bullet, and retaining is typically the number one expense for any large employer is, is their people, and getting the best people is critical. Um, we've hired a lot of people in the last 18 months, over 100 people, so for me, just peace of mind as, as the person in charge of running this thing is, can I trust that everybody knows how to do their job? Can you know? Are they indoctrinated on how we how we do business here? Are they? Do they know it's okay to speak up in front of everyone in a company meeting and voice concern? So to me, this is about scale. Can you scale your your company? Really depends on can you scale your values. Um, and so you know, we spend a lot of time on onboarding and training and using our own product, um, interactive, our new video product too make sure people know about what we're about. Um, we actually, because we connect our values to how we think about customers, we just are releasing some data that shows we have a 64 points higher on net promoter score than the HR, average HR software. And then, you know, we like awards too, just kind of tying back to the cycle on the right, like great companies, they win awards. So there are ways to measure this. It's can you attribute perfect causality? No, but I think we all know that the life of a HR leader and a, and a people leader is one of strongly educated database guests, and, and we know that these numbers are significantly higher maybe than companies that don't invest in culture. I have a question. So when um, you know, I go back and look at your values, are there any values that are harder to reinforce than others? or? What's kind of been the most challenging for you to make sure is implemented and understood? I think it depends a little on the the, the nature or the personality of the employee. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give a couple examples. So we have a lot of uh, software engineers here. Software, you know, I think brilliant. They do something I can't do, <laughs> and they just think in awesome ways. Um, but it's also their job to be extremely logical and look for risk and make sure that things will work properly. So for them, maybe the anything is possible. Like, of course we can do this. We can take on the world. Not all of them, of course. But for one or two of them, that's the, you know, they know where the bugs are. Certainly quality testers are like this. They're looking for defects in the prog program. But the hardest one for me personally to think about people living to is speaking plainly because people like to be liked. They like the management team and the company to think they're a, a, a good soldier and a cheerful participant in your company. So we, I personally, and, and I think we try to go out of our way, maybe to bite our tongue when we when we want to say, no, you're wrong, employee, you actually are missing the point here, and just let let it happen so that they can say, you know, you guys, the way we're doing this is totally wrong. Frankly, most of our best innovation has not come from the leadership of the company. It comes from the people who are dealing every day with customers, who are dealing every day with code, who who see a customer challenge that we don't see here um, in headquarters sometimes. So I think speaking plainly and getting people to be transparent is the hardest part. And when you see those comments flowing in that that they think something's messed up, as long as they're willing to participate in a dialogue about that, and maybe it's even anonymously, as long as they're willing to give detailed feedback on how, what the problem is, or maybe even if they have ideas on how to solve the problem, that's great. You know, we, we're not really big on um, anonymous grenade throwing, like, hey, this sucks and you suck, but I'm not going to tell you why or what my ideas are. You know, we really encourage people to give that hard feedback, but at least describe the problem in detail for us to figure it out. Okay. Great. 
Great. Thank you so much, Henry and Kevin. Um, I think that was a lot of really great takeaway, you know, on how to integrate these values in your own culture. And take it from the CEO of uh, the top best place to work in Washington State. So I want to open this up now to um, questions. Feel free to continue adding your own. To start off with, um, is there anything that you shouldn't do in creating a value statement? Well, my view is you got to aim big, so don't aim small. Um, don't worry about um, don't worry about this year or even next year when you're doing it. And also, don't worry too much about uh, you know try to be try to work with people you like, but make sure you work with people who align with your values because times are tough in businesses, especially if you're in a, a growth I mean, in any, any business. Times are tough, and you know they get reinvented. Technology transforms them. And to get you through hard times, you need something that's very tied to who that person is. So I think um, you'll attract and retain people who are bought into the mission and the culture, and that's defined by the values. Great. Um, we have another question here. What do you think is the difference between engaging and inspiring employees? Uh, what do you do that is different in engaging versus inspiring employees? Well, the word inspire is a little scary to most people um, because it's, it's hard to think about motivating other people. Other people, it, it, in fact, it's not really how it works. You're either motivated intrinsically or you're not motivated intrinsically. The best thing an employer can do is create the organizational support for their well-being or the organizational support for them connecting to work to be really clear about what it is you're all about. If you do that repeatedly, you've created the environment for them to be really engaged. But you can't engage other people. The, the whole nature of engagement is not an extrinsic concept. It's intrinsic. It, engagement comes from within. So the best you can hope to do as a manager, as a, as a leader of a company, is to create the structure and the communication and the process so that they know exactly what you stand for. And then you'll end up just attracting and keeping people who are a good fit with that. It's hard, you can't just go engage and inspire other people except by just kind of the hard work of consistent application of these things. People will find their own purpose and, and follow it. That's my take, Kevin, maybe yeah. you disagree, I don't know. No, I, I was... We can argue too. It, it made me think that maybe that's how work has changed. And you know, back in the day, it was a leader's job to inspire their employees to do greater. And I think what we're saying now is, it's not our job to inspire. It's our it's our job to engage so that you can find that motivation from what's in yeah. within. And then you know what? The truth is, most people aren't staying at companies for their entire lifetime. So you've got to do what's best for you. And hopefully, there's a good win between what you want to accomplish, what your company needs from you, and uh, both both benefit from that. So I think the the workplace has changed uh, in that regard. Yeah, I, th I think whether it's I think there's this mega trend towards the word empowerment you sometimes hear a lot. Like, are you empowered to make a difference at your work? Well, if you're going to empower people, you still have to empower them towards a strategic goal for your company. Mm -hmm. So that's why having it even in the recruiting and hiring process, but definitely in the day-to-day -day alignment, you know, we have, we actually have a, a someone who's leaving to go be a dance instructor. That was her life's dream. So for us, that's awesome because she's, it's in alignment with her values that she's going to do that. It's in alignment with the company, and she'll be an advocate for us after she's gone. So for us, that's a great, that's a great thing. And, and in today's economy, people maybe they aren't taking 20-year gigs like they used to, um, but how they talk about you after they leave or while they're there is really important. That was a great question. It made me think we should do yeah. a blog post about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looks like there's a few more too. We love yeah. it. Yeah. Um, how do you rank people? Uh, this is specifically around the Limey values. Um, how do you rank people on the Limey values during an interview? Uh, have you developed interview question sets based on each value? And if so, how do you develop those question sets? Yes, and they're, they're a little proprietary, but um, we, have, uh, we have values. We have attributes and behaviors that we think are very closely aligned with those values. We've documented that for um, individual contributors, managers, and leaders at the company. We have sample interview questions professionally developed around the behaviors connected to those values, and we do behavioral interviewing. So we actually have a full 
um, multi-level blowout of the value, a two or three sentence description of the value, the behaviors and attributes, and the sample question. So it's, it's actually pretty rigorous and structured. Um, any thoughts on how to drive a common culture in recently merged organizations? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, we, we, we've only done one acquisition in our um, history. Uh, I think I think that's challenging. I mean, usually there, I would say, I would kind of turn the question around a little bit and think about it less like, hey, we just got merged. How can we squish our cultures together? I would actually think even upstream in before doing mergers and acquisitions and saying, if we're going to merge with a company, let's merge with one that's really 80% overlaps with us from a mission point of view. From We have the same values. We hire the same for the same kind of motivators because it's actually, you know, I think the evidence shows that 70 plus percent of M&A is not financially accretive for the acquiring company. And I think the main reason is culture. And in fact, I know someone personally who has probably worked on 50 acquisitions for a major employer. And when I asked that person, what's the reason it doesn't work when it doesn't work? It's always culture. I've um, been on both sides, and I think it really depends on the business goals. In some cases, a company may want to leave another company as an independent entity and preserve that culture and decision making, and so there isn't any um, effort to really merge two things together. And another case where they really wanted us to be part of the culture, um, they did everything like within three days we had moved into the new quarters building and we uh, broke up teams so they were working cross-functionally with other people in the new organization. So you almost try to get rid of the structure and the location and the environment as quick as you can kind of force that uh, integration. Hmm. Definitely. Um, we have one more question that I think actually ties in pretty well with uh, things that you guys just covered in other questions. But um, if you have any additional feedback, it's do you incorporate any values-based pre-screening for potential employees? Yeah, I mean, for us, that's part of the interviewing. But I think that's you're talking about even up, upstream of that. I think that's a little harder. And frankly, even interviewing, I mean, you, if you only have let's say six hours with someone, and that's pretty much how much time we would spend interviewing most candidates. Even six hours isn't really enough. So um, I think about the pre-screening less as us screening them out and more as because we're very public with our values and we try to maybe talk ad nauseum about our culture, it actually, it, it, we use it more as who's going to be attracted naturally to that. So, you know, if, if you're applying and interested and you tell, or I think I've seen in, in Tiny Pulse's questions, and you're kind of comfortable telling us about one of our values and why it's interesting to you, that's probably good enough. So we probably don't screen a lot of people out on that. Um, rather, we think about, we just naturally get a pool of applicants who probably is drawn to us. And I think that's the best way because then you're not, it's not a negatively phrased thing like, oh, we ruled them out, because you can't really know someone's values from their resume. In fact, you might not know them until two years in, and then you'll find something out that, that helps you see how great of a fit they are, or maybe how not so great they are. Yeah, one of the things that we do, and I think it's, it's not screening, it's more self-screening, is uh, anytime we post a job at Tiny Pulse, we list our values, and we ask all candidates to go through an exercise where they give us an example of uh, two of our values and how they've applied them in earlier work experiences. And so what I think that does is it kind of weeds out a lot of candidates who aren't interested or don't want to take the time to do it. And uh, it really helps those that are interested in it think about what's important to them. And it gives them a glimpse about uh, the priority we put on values once you join our company. Yeah, and I like to think about different companies. I mean, if you're, let's say you're in the oil and gas business and you're extracting petroleum out of the ground, it's a commodity product, but safety is absolutely critical. That you might actually have a value connected to that that's about you know incredible attention to detail that might not be as relevant if you're you know selling flowers for or where a human relationship is more important so really also think about your strategy i often give the navy seals example if you love waking up at you know 4 in the morning and getting yelled at because you're trying to do something really great that's that's tied to a greater mission 
that's fine, but that's not for everyone. So th that's where the self-selection comes in. You can actually, people will go, you know, go through walls or, you know, have their face thrown in the mud <laughs> and yelled at because they believe in something greater. And so as long as those aspirational statements you make to the market um, are true and you're trying hard to sail close to those, um, you'll, you'll get people who believe in those things. So. And I just want to say also thanks so much for uh, having me and, and Kevin, really great to spend time with you today. Yeah, thanks for hosting us and sharing so much of your great advice. Yeah, really appreciate it, you guys. And, you know, just as a thank you for everyone listening today, too, uh, we want to extend an offer to um, sign up for a free assessment, kind of more around this. You can um, see how many of your own employees are aware of your values as well as gain actionable feedback on solutions to build the best workplace you can. So just head to tinypulse.com and thank you again for listening and thank you again to uh, Henry and Kevin for a great webinar. Thanks. Thank you.